place. Uh, uh, the, the talk of today will be a sort of kind of uh, not what you would expect for me uh, as subject, but I think I, I hope I can convince you that uh, studying catalysis is uh, not only important, uh, but also uh, scientifically exciting. And the title of the interfacial catalyst is actually the, the, the there is a, no, we, oh, here. Yeah. Okay, there should be a, okay. The title of the catalyst was an invention of Robert Schlegel, who is an experimentalist from the Max Planck in Berlin and uh, who, with whom I discuss many issues of catalysis and uh, with whom I share a vision of what uh, catalyst uh, is all about. Okay, so catalysis is one most important uh, uh, process. And uh, if we want to move towards a greener world, we need a good catalyst for a variety of things, they generate H2, capture CO2, uh, reduce many chemical, pro uh, I, I will uh, discuss in a while, uh, 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 the production of ammonia is some um, chemical processes of industrial relevance are uh, energy intensive. And uh, of course, uh, to be impactful, you have to be able to do that uh, to a very a large scale because you want to produce the tons and tons of the stuff. Okay, so I know. Okay, so uh, to catalysis, it generally it is associated uh, this picture. You start uh, from A. You have a <coughs> Reactants, so you have product, uh, the reaction passes through a transition state, and the function of the catalyst is uh, really to lower this transition state. Of course, uh, I, we will, I, I will not uh, <coughs> disclaim uh, this thing is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is very important because. Uh, the transition state is the needle through which the reaction has to pass to go from A to B. Uh, but in general, if you look in the books, uh, this is associated to uh, some static picture. So the, the catalyst uh, can be some nanoparticle, can be a step on the surface, can be a chemical there, and so on. So there is <coughs> implicit uh, in the notion that have been taught, uh, they have been taught about catalysis of a static structure. A static structure which corresponds to a reactivity. Okay. But uh, if you pause uh, uh, a moment uh, and think how in the practice uh, catalysis carried out, uh, you will see that uh, in many industrial catalysts take place under condition of high temperature and pressure. And uh, it's far from these idealized things so because you have a flow of reagents uh, and the flow of product. Uh, and uh, so this calls uh, into, into question the static picture of a well-defined structure reactivity relation. And for instance, one example of, uh, <coughs> of uh, a passing feature is that when you prepare a catalyst in the lab, one of the issues is that you get the catalyst, but after a while, you have to replace it, okay? Uh, uh, but uh, in many cases, uh, that's not true for industrial reaction. The catalyst can occasionally be poisoned and you have to refresh it, but you don't have to throw everything. It is the same catalyst. And uh, so this is an example of an industrial reactor. Uh, so that's like a bomb uh, because you have to screen 
uh, this is the, the environment the, uh, from, uh, from the high pressure and high temperature. Okay, so <clears throat> I will argue that uh, uh, present theoretical models are inadequate and the fully dynamical approach is needed. And uh, this is, we base this on methodological approaches which allow us to, uh, uh, to do molecular dynamic simulations. And in particular, this is uh, machine learning methods have been and really an, an enabling technology for us. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll not talk in abstract, and uh, I will present the result of the, we'll, we'll go into it, the composition of ammonia on this uh, uh, lithium imide compound. And uh, the, of course, we are not the first to worry about the theoretical models. And uh, in 1994, Ertel, uh, uh, one of the giants of the field, uh, he, 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 he championed the use of computer simulation in studying, uh, in studying catalysis. Okay, so a lot of, uh, of my, uh, a lot of my discussion will have to do with the production and uh, decomposition of, of uh, ammonia. Ammonia was, uh, was uh, discovered by these two gentlemen more than a century ago. And <laughs> it was a major breakthrough for mankind because it allowed the production of fertilizer and so alleviating famine in the world, and essentially the same process is still used as it was then, and it's not uh, after 100 years I really understood. That's uh, <laughs> uh, so the that's uh, uh, ammonia is also is used for fertilizer, but also for many other chemicals, and so uh, consumes a lot of our energy. 5% of the natural gas, 2% of the energy production, 5% of the global CO2. Huh? So to understand and make it uh, uh, this process cleaner is per se a worthwhile task. And the entry, uh, the ammonia is uh, another possible use, which is not, uh, uh, since it's uh, rich in hydrogen and we know how to transport ammonia, uh, it is planned to be a major energy carrier in the future. So as I said, it's still, we don't understand it. Okay. Now I will just wait, the, I, I will not talk uh, in, uh, uh, on the Abar Bosch, but I kind of will wait your appetite by showing what the effect uh, of a realistic simulation, uh, realistic uh, quote unquote, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a catalytic process uh, could be. Uh, we see only one step here of the process, namely the decomposition of a nitrogen molecule on the iron surface at the 700 Kelvin which is the temperature uh, at which the reaction operates. Now, if we use uh, the standard model in which you have a surface, and uh, this provides a potential energy surface in which uh, this ammonia molecule, we see, and we see how the reaction proceeds, it moves on the surface, and then it goes uh, into this uh, Catalytic site, with the jargon is called C7. This catalytic site is rich in electron, and the electron are donated to N2 bond, and the bond breaks. This donation is essential because you want to break a triple bond. Now, so this is the ideal. Now let's go to a more realistic simulation in the process in which we let 
everything moves uh, at 700 K. So again, here we have the same catalytic, the same molecules that goes there, but uh, there's a lot of mess, everything moves around, and uh, by the time it reacts, uh, molecule is gone out. Uh, the so if you were to extrapolate from here, the behavior there, it would be in uh, a bad shape. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so the theoretical tool for studying this thing, as has been mentioned, is uh, ab initio molecular dynamics, which we developed a long time ago with the Roberto Carr when we were much younger. Uh, and uh, in, the, in this scheme, you combine molecular dynamics because you have seen that the molecules uh, atoms move with uh, ab initio calculation because you want to describe these chemical processes where, where the bond is broken. And uh, this, uh, however, I mean, if we take this method, uh, however useful and powerful, we try to apply the method, we couldn't directly, we couldn't have done the simulation that uh, I've shown to you. Okay, so, and the basic reason that uh, it's an expensive enterprise and one needs a new set of tools uh, to address uh, this thing. I will go quickly through the tools, but uh, not, not spend awfully, not much time on the, on the, on the methodological part, uh, just give an impression of the ideas, uh, and then we look uh, into a more uh, fun uh, physical, Simulation. Okay, first uh, step, uh, we have very complicated system with many degrees of freedom. We, have, we need a language to uh, uh, describe the complexity in a way which is uh, humanly transparent. And so we use, uh, instead of using the potential energy surface, which is uh, a mess in a very high dimensional space, we, we use the free energy, we introduce a set of descriptors of collective variable or order parameter, reaction coordinate, each, each community has its own language there, and we project the probability distribution onto this important degrees of freedom, and usually these important degrees of freedom are also the slow degrees of freedom of the system. Okay, uh, there are ways of determining. Uh, I will not, again, I will not go uh, in detail, but just I show on a simple example how this collective uh, variable look like. Suppose we have a potential like this. We have one main barrier and two secondary barrier. And uh, this mode, so this uh, collective variable, the the lowest one will be related to the transition from this set of state to this other set of state. The second the lowest uh, uh, will be related to this transition inside, and the last one will be related to this high transition. Okay. And of course, determine this uh, CB is, uh, is, is, is crucial. And uh, for that, the neural network again come to our rescue. Non, non, neural network and physics, okay. Okay, so this is the, 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 the language that we're gonna use, but then we have still one other problem, uh, several other problems to address. One is uh, the sampling problem. Uh, uh, the time it takes, for instance, uh, going from a liquid to a solid is microscopic. And if we try to simulate it uh, with, uh, on a microscopic scale, we cannot bridge uh, the, the several orders of magnitude that are between, uh, that exist between the microscopic scale can be simulated and the real physical thing. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an issue. And again, we use, uh, we didn't uh, introduce in this way, but uh, 
one possible way of, uh, of uh, understanding what, uh, how this biasing method works. So we have free energy, uh, which has two minima. That's uh, the free corresponding free energy, which is like this. It's, uh, in the jargon bimodal. So if I start from here, here there is a region of very low probability, I never go there. Okay, so what uh, this, uh, this uh, sampling method do is they take uh, this bimodal uh, and they transform in something which is more easy to sample. So suppose uh, the time uh, magic wand and I can transform the red distribution into the blue one. This is very easy because there are no barriers. You can move as you want. Uh, or I can say, no, I don't want it flat. I don't like it. I like it a bit hilly. And that's, I can do this as a target distribution. So, but uh, the uh, an unsampling method do this. They start with something which is very difficult and they end up with something which is much easier. So if you want, uh, in a jocular uh, way, you can say we start uh, with Switzerland, uh, which is uh, the landscape uh, original. And we transform Switzerland into Tuscany. So instead of a rugged mountain, we have gentle and low uh, hills, and I can go easy from one valley to the other way. And of course, you have to have ways from this to go back to that. Uh, so this idea really will go to just show flash formula because, uh, because uh, 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 indicated just not waving the hands. So this uh, the latest method is opus. Uh, uh, which essentially does what I'm saying you. So start from here, it goes there and allows us to go back there and that we can totally skip and go to the next uh, ingredient uh, that we need uh, to have in our hand uh, to move forward, namely uh, the interaction potential. I want to be able to have an accurate reactive potential, which is able to uh, to describe uh, these uh, chemical processes. And again, here, we, uh, we did it the uh, first time a uh, long time ago. So we do a bunch of, uh, of uh, a initial simulation of DFT calculation on many different uh, configuration. And we fit uh, this data to a neural network, which provides an analytic, if complicated, representation of the interaction potential. And uh, essentially, it's same accurate uh, as the uh, Abinitian D, of course, uh, is much cheaper. Allows us to do things uh, which uh, what would have been. And the way we do is uh, we start, uh, say, with, with Abinitian simulation on a small system. We obtain the first data table, train the potential, run to this potential, uh, compute new this, and we go through this, this loop. And uh, we use an unsampling to explore new configuration. Okay, so that's the end of the methodology. And so you can breathe more lightly. And now we go to an application, which I think is illustrative of our idea of, of, of how a real catalyst works. And here, rather than trying to synthesize ammonia, we suppose ammonia is being produced and we want now to use it as a candidate for hydrogen storage. Huh? And because of many te technological advantages and also far less dangerous than H2, and you can keep a low temperature at a high temperature and so on and so forth. Okay, so the question is how are we going to, uh, from ammonia, obtain hydrogen? Okay, so there's been, uh, 
quite a, quite a significant activity on this catalyst, lithium to NH. And I'm not, uh, I'm not a chemist, but I've been told that this compound is called lithium imine or imine. Okay, and uh, <coughs> these are uh, the measure the conversion uh, of uh, different uh, and compare different uh, uh, catalysts. So some are really standard, like rutinium, they are made us, uh, uh, but this is a totally different uh, uh, catalyst and it's, uh, it's more efficient, uh, clearly more efficient than the others. Okay, although not that also here, you have to go to 700 Kelvin to have a significant activity. Okay, so we, we need to study this uh, lithium imide, and that's already a, a clue to what I'm going to say, because typically when you look at catalysts, they, they have a, a, a group of molecules described, uh, some chemical structure. Here we have to worry about how is the solid state uh, uh, crystal of this compound is. So this is an ionic compound, uh, and crystallized roughly in a, in a antifluorized structure. Huh? And uh, you have the doubly charged thing, then you have the lithium in these tetrahedral positions. And like in ionic compounds, you want to preserve charge neutrality. And so there is an alternation or negative and positive charge to obtain, uh, to obtain uh, the local neutrality. Uh, that's not quite it. Uh, it, the, the, it can produce some defect. So the lithium can move into a tetrahedral position and also in a tetrahedral. So they can be, uh, can go, can form a vacancy and an interstitial. Okay. Uh, it is a super ionic system, like uh, many ionic systems in which there is a, a larger ratio between the radii of the two ions. Uh, the system becomes uh, uh, super ionic. This NH, the imine, is fixed, but uh, the lithium, they move around the place. And the mechanism of by which uh, the lithium moves uh, is uh, here, it goes uh, tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral. So, that's uh, the, our, 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 our method can, our approach can describe without adjustable parameter, this thing. And you can study it as a function of temperature. Experimentally, there is a transition here and we, we do a good job. Okay. Uh, while we are talking of the property of uh, this amide, I want to underline one property because we'll have to uh, discuss it, uh, one property of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the ionic compound. So if you, yeah, that's uh, the spectrum. So you have a gap. This is the homolumo gap on the crystal, very large. But then suppose you take out uh, a, an imine, so you take out uh, two negative charges, uh, two electrons will be trapped in the cavity, forming this localized state, which is called the F center hmm? of some type. So we have this electronic state, which is quite unique to the ionic crystal. And these are things that they derive from the need to establish charge neutrality uh, the survive also the defective. So even if you are in a defective antifluoride structure, these are still stable state, and you see 
left center is a state in the gap, like in the physical semiconductors when you have an impurity. Okay. Now, so this is the crystal. To have a catalyst, we have to cut our crystal. And so we look at the surface. And what you see, nothing special happens. The imide, the surface, remain at the surface, but the lithiums, they start moving around. So it just says you were to cut the system. Nothing very dramatic. But now, and that's where, where we go uh, to the core of what I want to show you, is expose our surface to ammonia molecule. Uh, uh, what happens? Uh, uh, they say, oops, there is this exchange. This reaction has taken place. Huh? And then uh, the second ammonia comes uh, and the, the second uh, such a reaction takes place. So at the end of the day, what you have, you have twice uh, this reaction. So originally you had the neutral and the doubly charged, and now you have two singly charged molecules. The presence of this uh, defect has dramatic consequences on the property of the surface, because now you cannot do this uh, plus minus plus minus, uh, which is characteristic of the ionic system. You have, uh, ions that have the different charges, you have another extra ions, and so uh, the, the surface is no longer stable. There is other layer, and the mean can also become mobile, at least in the surface state. Okay. Uh, that's very clear in this, uh, uh, this uh, plot where there's a kind of scatter plot. Uh, in the super ionic phase, you see we have uh, the lithium that move all over the place and, and, and they mean the stays there. Uh, before the reaction, they mean still stay there and the lithium move all over the place. After the reaction, then you see that uh, this extra layer is formed and the, the Top layers have become more like a liquid than a solid. Okay, now why is then important for catalysis? And to understand why it is important, we may, for instance, uh, uh, look at how uh, nature does it. Hmm? There is an enzyme, nitrogenase, which uh, uh, does uh, uh, the Haber Bosch kind of thing. Huh? So you start with the with the an ammonia molecule, and you end up with the uh, with the nitrogen molecule, you end up with the, an ammonia. Uh, and these are the reaction paths. Huh? We want to go from here to there, but uh, never mind. I think it's more or less the same. So there are different pathways. You go through different intermediates. During this process, uh, you have to have uh, protons and electrons. This put a name here, which is a metal of the thing, which stabilizes uh, uh, these intermediates, uh, and so on and so forth. So there are essentially three ingredients uh, that allow this uh, 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 nitrogen as enzyme to work. Uh, is the ability that the enzyme has to give or take electrons, give or take protons, and there is something is light missing now. I, 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 ah, no, no, it's a letter, sorry. And uh, stabilize intermediate. Huh? So this dynamical surface has all this uh, ability. We can, proton can move from imine to imine with the mechanism for the condensate, which is similar 
to a glottus mechanism. So a proton can be added and taken away from this uh, surface layer. That's uh, more interesting. I can also store and take electrons from the system. The electrons can be uh, stored in a log F like, F center like localized state or in a surface state, which is taken into place by the dipolar moment of the system. And you can go as, as time progresses from localized to delocalized. But both these states are surface state. And finally, you can stabilize uh, <coughs> odd intermediate chemicals like this one, because of the lithium, which are mobile, can stabilize this uh, doubly charged uh, diamine, whatever you call it, also this other structure, this other structure, and more noticeably, the H minus uh, becomes uh, stabilized by the uh, super ionic environment. Uh, uh, so I, I just go through the first step, but I will not go into great detail. So uh, this is a very interesting first step. So I have here two NH2 minus, two imines. So this imine, this is the cavity in which the imine sits. Now they form a bond and they leave behind the vacancy. Electrons now go and move to this vacancy. And this, this vacancy can become delocalized and you go to this state where you have the diamine and the electron. Another state, another uh, reaction that is uh, um, enabled by the condition in which the, the surface is, uh, is, uh, is NH, NH2 minus, can lose a proton. Huh? This is a very unlikely event in the gas phase, but here we have the lithiums. The lithiums kind of surround this uh, proton and extract, abstract the proton from uh, the amine, and you end up with uh, uh, one of the product is NH minus in solution. So that's enabling rather unusual and complicated chemistry. Now, we cannot go through all things, but uh, what happens after that, we have this diamine that can lose protons and eventually leads uh, to uh, a, a nitrogen molecule that floats out uh, of uh, the system. And also this form H2 and floats out. So at the end of the day, we go back uh, to the origin. And if I stop, uh, pumping nitrogen inside, the catalyst returns to its origin, okay? So this is, but now, so I will close here. So uh, why is a good catalyst? Ammonia activates the surface, inducing an almost ionic liquid behavior. Reaction take place at the activated surface. We can exchange protons and electrons and uh, and stabilize uh, charge intermediate, <coughs> it partakes of the benefit of uh, heterogeneous and homogeneous uh, catalysis. Because heterogeneous are advantageous because from engineering point of view, you have uh, the product, that, uh, the, the reagents that come and the product that go. Huh? Uh, the uh, homogeneous, it's a liquid. So you have then to separate the product. You don't need to do that. And yet the dynamic of, of the surface, like in a liquid, allow uh, a reaction to take place without uh, needing to be associated to any specific structure. And that we think this is a model for other catalysts. The catalytic site is associated not to a specific static atom, but to any, but an out of equilibrium interfacial fluctuating state. 
So similar things happen in other reaction that we are studying, in particular the Haber-Bosch. And of course, uh, it would be unwise to generalize uh, to other catalysts, but uh, this is the German uh, saying, which means Aymal once is uh, uh, never, as it never happened, uh, twice is always. And, uh, uh, that's a, a sample of uh, uh, lithium imide. And that's uh, uh, Professor Schlegel, with whom uh, we had many discussions and indebted to him for his insight into, for partaking his insight into catalysis. And uh, uh, before coming here, I, I went to uh, Lisboa for a seminar, and uh, what uh, I, I came, uh, I found this quote from Saramago. Uh, my, I'm sure you know he was uh, his uh, Nobel Prize for literature, and that means that uh, chaos is an order that we have to decipher. And with this, I will. I think that's our job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Michele, for the uh, beautiful presentation. Um, so we we can now uh, take questions. Uh, maybe first uh, from the from the room, um, and we can also get questions from Zoom. I will take care of reading uh, the questions aloud. So people in uh, on Zoom, please uh, just put your questions in the question and answer box. So. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Quentin. I work in Lyon in also uh, metadynamics um, simulations. And I was wondering, what do you think? So do you think this type of simulations could also be achieved and let's say give the same message with other enhanced sampling molecular dynamics method? Uh, uh, as the, mm, Okay, if I understand you. As far as the main context, uh, content of the talk, uh, which is to get a picture of how a catalyst work, uh, whether I use uh, uh, OPEs or use uh, either umbrella sampling or use whatever you want to use, this will be unaffected. It might affect the details of how the reaction takes place, but not the general picture. Now, uh, we use uh, we use uh, this uh, technique because we invented and we are happy with it, and so uh, until proven wrong, we we'll stick uh, to what we know. But I mean, I'm I'm open. I mean, I really am. Uh, I I really am not ideological. Huh? I I I take what what's uh, useful. But you, okay. Yes, Yves Petrov. Uh, please wait for the microphone, otherwise people will not hear you. Okay. Our very nice calculation. What about the experiment? Some of the things that are here, we said they can be they can be found in the experiment. The Grotus mechanism is there. They did some experiment with the mixed crystal of imin and amid, and that's a better thing. And we believe that's because order uh, that announces the disorder at the surface. Uh, they speculate some of the intermediate that we have discovered. People, they say that they, they are chemists, they have written in the papers, but never just out of the blue. Uh, uh, <laughs> chemists know, I mean, they never under, underestimate the chemist. Uh, okay. So, but some other details now are, are really in line with, uh, with what, uh, with what uh, and also that uh, the, uh, the, the, what do you call it, uh, the nitrogen can move during the reaction. They have tagged, uh, they, they use isotope and they see indeed that that, uh, that happens. So I think it's compatible with what we know. 
Uh, of course, for experimentalists uh, to go beyond uh, uh, have a tough life more than us, because doing experiment, as they say, in operando condition, uh, 700, 100 bars, it's a tough call. Yes. Please. But they are getting better. So we think we are, we are coming closer. Yes, John Kiefer. About, about the hydrogen storage, uh, generally speaking. So you suggest ammonia could be an interesting um, nitrogen, uh, hydrogen storage, uh, but the condition used to um, uh, uh, dissociate hydrogen from nitrogen in ammonia, 700 degrees, is pretty similar to what we have for the decomposition of uh, natural gas uh, methane. Uh, and uh, in this sense, wouldn't methane be sim simpler as a, as a hydrogen storage? Uh, uh, that's an engineering question, and then I take for that uh, what they tell me. Huh? Uh, I know, and I, they must have the reasons, but they uh, we are part of a big project, uh, German, huh? of many universities, and many, and many companies on studying the, the composition of ammonia for this purpose. And for sure, I know that uh, uh, the infrastructure for the uh, distribution of ammonia are being prepared, okay? okay. So Rotterdam has got, I don't know, six lines or something, huh? already there. So what the engineering reason for that are, that I don't know. It is also possible that they, at the end of the day, we'll not, not use the lithium imide, but some other concussion. But like uh, yeah. More questions in the room? Yes. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. You certainly said it, maybe, I'm, but I guess I missed it. Could you please say again, in this hybrid approach that you use with um, machine learning techniques, where is this crucial step that allows us to save computational power with respect to the traditional ab initio molecular uh, the, dynamics? The basic thing that we could not without is the construction of the potential, because that would be two things, ab initio would be costly per se, and also would scale very badly with system size. So it becomes soon very, very prohibited. The other thing where we, I talked about the non-sampling, that's useful, extremely useful, but uh, you could do it with thinking and doing as, as well. Also, that facilitates the thing. But the first, without uh, the and then potential that would not have been possible. Uh, we yes, uh, we have a question over there. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And I have a follow-up question on the neutral uh, the neural network potential. How transferable are they? Does it mean that you need to use this DFT ab initio data in order to feed to the potential and create your force field? Yeah, that, that's of course, I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, as they say, there is no free lunch. Huh? And so to, have, uh, to, to be able to scale uh, the, the initial calculation in the way that we do, uh, uh, you have to be careful. Huh? It's not guaranteed. But there are uh, an indicator that tells you whether you're doing fine or not. Uh, to give you an idea of the of how we operate, so we generate a, we've generated a lot of data, like hundred thousand DFT calculation, uh, and uh, we split this data into n batches. We train say n four batches. Uh -huh. We train four different neural networks. And as the simulation proceeds, we check whether 
they predicted more or less the same result. If, if uh, that's not the case, we stop, we make a simulation, and uh, we add this data to the old one, and we train a new set of things. <clears throat> and that's typically what happens. And, uh, but you're right, I mean, we take our risk. So, so in the end, we look carefully at the chemistry that we find, whether we can justify, find the argument, why that is. If you ask me, uh, in, in, it's me that is calling somebody. Uh, uh, if, you, if you ask me, all the first part uh, uh, until the, uh, you say, the, the melting, let me call it for a better word, of the surface includes it, that's I, I would bet uh, any amount. We can go to Bocuse together if we are wrong. But uh, uh, the rest, uh, whether this, is, this reaction is more likely than the other one, and so on, if there are no other reactions, that I cannot swear. Uh, and, but uh, as I said, that's uh, less interesting because we have shown that uh, in this new environment, uh, many new and unheard of uh, things can happen, and, and we have also checked the separated. This is stable, the other is stable, the other. Okay, we we done we done our best to uh, make sure that uh, maybe it's not the what happens uh, real in terms of chemistry, but uh, what we show is not unlikely. Thank you, Michele. Uh, we're going to take a few questions from. Uh, 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 the people who are on Zoom. We have many people on Zoom. And first, we have a question from Marius Retegan, who asks you, uh, how do you ensure that the trained potential is appropriate to treat, to treat bone breaking? Well, I have answered that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right now. But, and, and really, is trained on data in which bones are not broken. exactly the same question. But it's yeah. the same question. Yeah, yeah. So, but we do put uh, in the in the training uh, the bomb processing, which uh, uh, any time we see a reaction take its place immediately, <laughs> we go to the FT and uh, add uh, this data to the. Thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Pietro Zambon. We thanks you for the nice talk, and asks, what is the time scale of the reaction you showed? And does the dynamical approach give a different value than the static one? Oh, that's a, that's a uh, uh, complicated question. Uh, yes. man, uh, no, because uh, uh, I, I, I would uh, we we can give you an idea of the barrier that uh, huh? like uh, under kill in some units don't don't. Uh, uh, so it's a, a 700 degrees of the reasonable barriers, and these are only rough estimates. The other thing is that uh, uh, short of, I mean, if you had an infinite uh, computer, you could run, run, and calculate, and see all these reactions, calculate the flux, and so on. But in this varying environment, uh, the usual tools of quantum game is that you look for the transition state, and then the bar and the prefactor. They are close to impossible to be applied, even if they were uh, the, right, the, the right things to do, huh? because this is moving such a surface. So I cannot answer. I can tell you the barriers are reasonable. Thank you. Uh... We have another question from Marius Retegan, who writes, as far as I know, the nitrogenase mechanism is still very much open to debate. Can you apply the same approach to bring additional insight? And what complications would be in applying the machine learning approach to study the natural catalysts? To, 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 uh, to the nitrogenase? Yes, yes, no, nitrogenase. No, I, I wouldn't touch at this stage the nitrogenase because uh, 
it, the chemistry is even more complicated. That they mm -hmm. have a spin and so on. So DFT would be, uh, and that's something which people are studying. And I, I, and I know from what I had talks on the subject matter, uh, and uh, they they make every use of uh, experimental data. So they really they they don't have an approach which can. Uh, can really go from A to B, and also occasionally there are steps in which the DFT doesn't work well. So really bad. Okay. So I uh, uh, don't think uh, the technology is uh, today is able to. But um, again, if somebody, yeah. uh, if he comes up with a new scheme, uh, we we'll, we we'll, will we'll all have upload uh, okay. the one with us. Thank you. Are there more questions in the room? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. I was wondering if you could say a few more words about the collective uh, variables. So you say that uh, you need to um, uh, simplify the system and use these collective variables. Uh, in this particular- no, 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 Just uh, let, me, let me see. Uh, the, the simulation that we do uh, use all the degrees of freedom explicitly, okay? It, we are not doing the dynamics of the variables. That we was also uh, a question. Yeah, no, no, no. Otherwise, I mean, that would be, I mean, would not be, uh, no, no. It's the full 3N system that we study. And then the, the variable are used in two contexts. Huh? One is to interpret huh? the data because of the, uh, this, uh, what do you know? Uh, and, uh, and the other is uh, in the presence of slow modes, our, our, our method uh, kind of enhance the fluctuations of this mode and allow them to occur on the time scale of, of that we can afford. But otherwise, the degree of freedom are all there. Thank you. Yes, some question over there? Maybe a, a quick follow-up on, on to that question. So, so you keep the number of particles fixed for all of your, like starting from training until the final uh, simulations already with the neural network, right? No, no, that's not. So one advantage of, of, of this that you can scale up. So we train the potential on all sorts of sizes, small and so on and so forth. But then we use this information or smaller system to treat the larger system. So it seems, maybe there are more questions I need to check. Yes, we have a, one more question here from a guest called Ahmad. And uh, Ahmad asks, it was mentioned that the method has the same accuracy as DFT method, but much cheaper. I'd like to know how much more affordable. Thanks. <laughs> Again, well, there is no unique thing because uh, at the, and also it's an unfair, uh, unfair statement. Uh, uh, so the DFT, scales uh, cubically with system size. So there is a limit uh, to what you can do. Uh, within the range in which we have uh, DFT and, uh, and this neural network calculation can be carried out, uh, I will say that uh, four or five orders of time. It's huge because that you have to do the electronic structure calculation, orthogonalize, do the calculate the density and so This is a function. That you have to, it's like a potential, it's a complicated function. So, but it's a little more than the standard uh, uh, MD based on, a, I say, one order of magnitude relative to give or take. Uh -huh. Since I don't do myself the thing, that would be my uh, uh, thumb. So, something which you can do uh, on your workstation. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have a question. Are there 
some other uh, catalysis problems or that oh. you have been looking at and uh, or that you intend to look at or what, what, what? yeah so we have a, a long term project with uh, some of the companies that uh, i listed there uh, that on the harbor bosch we mm -hmm. uh, also because uh, you know that that's uh, like uh, the the gasoline engine i mean it's yeah. not, not the best but it, everybody has got it they can't throw it away so they they tend to would like to improve the thing uh, but there have been other suggestion other catalysts have been suggested and in the particular we, we have a phd we studying uh, barium hydrate bah uh, 2 and uh, we tested some fish similar to this. I think it will work a bit in my huh? similar to work. So uh, dry mal okay. will be at the end of okay. this. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's time to close the seminar, the, the colloquium, and uh, thank Michele much, uh, very much for the very beautiful presentation.